think outside the box. Please raise your hand if you've heard of this phrase or a similar phrase in the past. Looking out into the crowd, I can see that many of us have heard these sorts of hyped up phrases. We know that they are used to motivate. However, hype can have more of an adverse effect, especially when related to technology. We need to be able to look past that hype to see what is truly of substance and what is not of substance. But before that, let us understand what hype really is. Several researchers and scholars have attempted to explain and visualize how hype works. Most notably, Roy Amra, who is a Stanford researcher, said in his theory that we tend to overestimate the technological impact of an innovation in the short run, and we underestimate its impact in the long run, which was then visualized by research firm Gartner's hype cycle, which shows that all technologies go through an initial innovation phase where people begin to start working on it, after which the public starts putting expectations on it, leading to the peak of inflated expectations, until ultimately we might see that those expectations don't go out, and it falls down into the trough of disillusionment, until ultimately, after a while of innovation, it reaches a sort of plateau of productivity, where it's truly gained space in society. If we, as the future leaders of America, can understand how this hype cycle works and understand how technologies go through it, we can better scale these technologies to serve society because hype has always had a drastic impact on the world. However, ever since the beginning of the information age, where technology, or rather, the promise of technology was given out an exceedingly high rate, this has changed dramatically. And with those promises came promises of what that technology could do some legitimate and some illegitimate. One of the very first technologies that went through this happened in the 1990s, a decade where hype was very extreme. And this technology was the internet. When it first came out, it was made by the Department of Defense and named ARPANET, after the agency that created it. It was used for Cold War communications in the event of a nuclear strike. But with the invention of the World Wide Web by Tim Berners-Lee in the 1990s, it was brought out to the media and the public. And as the Wired article says in 1998, it became one of those quintessentially 90s things. Authors and artists put them in to gain instant contemporary credit, while newspapers tacked it onto the end of seemingly mundane items to make them relevant again. Now, as a staple of productivity for today's society, it may seem like the internet never could have failed, and that it could have never went through the trove of disillusionment that's displayed above. However, it too had to deal with some bad publicity. As even Bill Gates, who was crowned the prince of the World Wide Web, said in his book, The Road Ahead, that he did not believe that at the time the internet had enough technology or infrastructure to support the amount of people that were coming to it. And even more shocking was the 1995 Newsweek article, which condemned the internet, saying that it simply would not pan out, as his local mall does more sales in an evening than the entire internet does in a year. Now, if we think about that now, that seems almost absurd. We have companies like Amazon and eBay, which dominate the market and allow us to basically get items from our fingertips. But at the time, this was truly the case. In 2000, investors believed that the internet would not pan out to their expectations, causing the bubble to pop. But as Forbes says in 2017, if we fast forward 19 years later, the internet is allowing new businesses to overtake the businesses of old. As it truly escaped the hype and reached this plateau of productivity and serves as one of the centerpieces of productivity today. But another technology that occurred during the 1990, but was not as prominent as the internet, was virtual reality. Shockingly enough, visions of virtual reality included virtual surgery, virtual banking, and virtual Mars missions. And people in the 90s believed that that would come in the same decade. But if we look at virtual reality now, it simply has not panned out. It most recently emerged with the video gaming industry and went through the hype cycle yet again, going up to a peak of inflated expectations. But once it didn't reach the investors' expectations, it's fallen right back into the trail of disillusionment. But to completely disregard the technology would be to disregard all the merits that it has gained. 
it has in fact worked in several fields, including healthcare. While it might not be at the large scale that people in the 90s expected or in such a short period of time, we are piloting virtual surgeries where doctors are able to do small scale surgeries across even borders or even across the globe using specialized VR technology. So should we give up on a technology just because we've been burned in the past? The examples of the internet and VR show that if we do, we would be missing out on some exciting innovation. Now for youth and young people, this is increasingly important as hype allows us to recognize and take risks on technology. However, this can serve as a double-edged sword both beneficial as we are most open to change and open to seeing how these technologies work, but at the same time, it can be harmful as these technologies are more susceptible to failure. Yes, we do buy into the hype of phrases like just do it and other phrases like think outside the box, which allows us to be more open-minded and allows us to try and understand how these technologies work. But if we do so, as Bentley University puts it, this allows youth to be at the forefront of modern technology. We think through and with them. But on the other hand, as the Psychology Today magazine puts it, this can, allow, this can be pretty poor, as young people are less resilient to failure than our more experienced counterparts. And as such, because these technologies are more susceptible to failure, we might give up in the bus of the hype cycle, which could cause the innovation to be hampered and could cause people to drop that innovation. Now, you might be thinking that I'm speaking from an entirely disinterested perspective, but I myself have been working with the technology that's currently in the hype cycle, and that is the technology of blockchain. It was initially regarded as the holy grail of all technology, as people believed that it would usurp everything and become one of the greatest technologies to exist, much like the internet. However, it has fallen from that position, but it's still quite useful. It was initially created by Bitcoin anarchists and people who are disdainful of big banks and big governments who believed that there was a revolution in the way that currency could work and believed that they could usurp the euro and the dollar as an international currency standard. But there were significant problems in that technology. For one, transaction times were very high and they could simply not compete with centralized banking systems. And at the same time, the volatility of these currencies, changing as much as 90% in one day, hampered any real-world adoption. Even I, when I initially thought of currencies, I wanted to invest in a currency that could probably do well in the future. But when investors and people realized that these currencies had significant issues, they pulled out and they caused the price of these currencies to crash wildly. And I became completely disillusioned with what they were. But because I had spent so much time working in cryptocurrencies, I decided to look past that and look at the technology that powers it, which is the technology of the blockchain. And the blockchain itself serves its own purpose. It serves as an unalterable and untamperable audit log of data transactions. And as such, I founded a company named Scintillating because I believed it could be helpful for healthcare to help preserve research data and make it untamperable. And we can see that if we as youth are able to look past the hype and look at how these technologies that we've been given work, we can change how they're used in society. Now, ultimately, as Remy Frank, the head of the BNP Paribas puts it, age is no longer a factor in creating technologies. Before, it was 40 to 50. Then it was 30 to 40. And now you only have to be around 20 to 30 years old. And this is a trend that is noticeable everywhere. Of course, it's the fact that these technologies are becoming more prevalent and more open to different types of people, but it's also a change in society, a society which now accepts that young people can be the visionaries of our own ideas. And as such, if we can look past the hype and if we can look deeply at the technologies that we've been given, we can scale them and make them better. As a blog I once read noted, without the binders of past experience, we can attempt things that experienced executives would not even consider. In a world which is constantly changing, it's blink and you're behind. Youth is in fact a competitive weapon. If we're able to take this change and if we're able to take the hype and put it away and look towards realistic goals, we can truly change the world. Thank you.